Hi, everybody. I'm Steele Wagstaff. Welcome to the February uh, Pressbooks monthly product update. What I'm going to start the meeting with is showing you of several of the things that we have released um, and that are in production for all of our clients and open source Pressbooks users. The first thing that we want to share is that we have uh, added support to Pressbooks for Google Analytics 4. If you don't know, Google Analytics is a tool that allows you to add um, tracking information to your websites or to your pages and collect it in the Google Analytics dashboard and visualize who's visiting your site from where, how often, how long they're staying and those kinds of things. If you run a Pressbooks network, you have a built-in Cocoa Analytics integration, which will do all that stuff without tracking the user in the ways that Google does. But you also may want to do it with Google because Google provides additional tools and services. So this is an optional third-party integration. For many, many years, Google Analytics used something called UA or Universal Analytics. Um, it was a bit more aggressive in how it set and used cookies in order to comply with GDPR and some of the increased privacy regulations. Google has announced that they are retiring Universal Analytics on July 1st of this year. And they've released a new product called GA4 or Google Analytics 4. So what we've done is we've added support for Google Analytics 4 to Pressbooks. You can use either or both up until July 1st, at which point we'll remove support from the old retired product. So this is what it looks like. I'm gonna share a screen here and show you in Pressbooks how you would configure this. If you're a network manager, you'll come to your administer network in the settings page and you'll see a tab that says third-party tools. Previously, there was just a single field for Google Analytics. Now there's two fields, one that takes a UA ID and one that takes the new GA4 ID. They're slightly different. You'll know the difference based on the prefix. And we've added a little note here that informs people that this particular way of doing Google Analytics will stop working on July 1st. On the back end, what you would have to have done previously, there's a guide that covers all this. So if you want to know how to do this, here is the guide for network managers that we've written. I'm gonna drop this link in here if you want to visit it, but we describe how to do this and what happens. Um, so it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. But if you look here, this is an example of the Google Analytics dashboard that uses universal analytics. I haven't customized anything. I haven't built reports. I haven't done anything fancy. There's quite a lot of powerful tools that are outside the scope of what I can train you on and show you. But if you are a Google Analytics user or power user, this is the kind of dashboard you'd see. And it's sending information based on UA, the new, I'm sorry, based on GA4, the new Google Analytics method. The next thing that I wanna talk about is support for a feature that we sometimes call in, internally Shapeshifter. And what Shapeshifter is, is essentially a tool that allows you to customize the font families that are used in the header text and the body text for any given theme. So I, I just wanna share my screen and I'll kind of demonstrate what I mean by this. In Pressbooks, for any book that you use, you have the ability to choose a theme. So here are the 21 themes that are available on our hosted networks. You can see, if you look at these screenshots, the major difference for the themes are gonna be the typefaces that are used for headers and body text. There are other differences, but that is a big one. So you pick the theme that you like based on the appearance that you like best. In this case, I'm using McLuhan. Previously, McLuhan and Malala had a feature that let you change the typeface for the web book the PDF and the ebook, and only those two themes had it. Well, we've added this feature to all of our themes. So I'm going to activate the Andreessen theme, and you'll notice that the appearance of my book will then change. So when I visit this book now, it's going to look Andreessen y instead of McLuhan y. So when I visit this, you'll see that the chapter uses all of the um, Andreessen styles. Well, what's now present is if you go into theme options and go to web options, you'll see two new options for every theme, the header font and the body font. So right now you can see this is my header font, this is my body font. If I want to use the Andreessen theme but change the header and body font in the web book only, I can do that here and you'll see a drop down. So for my header font, let's say I want to use uh, Roboto. And the body font, I'm going to want to use spectral, for example. 
I'm going to save those changes here. Now, when I refresh this, you'll notice the header and body font have just changed. I'm now using whatever I chose. I can't remember. Uh, Roboto is now being displayed for the header font throughout my book. And Spectral is now my body font. You can customize this separately or the same way in the PDF export options. So here, let's say I want to use um, Leto for my header and Noto Serif, or no, let's, uh, let's go with Crimson Text for the body font. And you can also customize it for the ebook. I'm just gonna show you the PDF for now. So I'm gonna go to my PDF export tool. I'm gonna generate a new digital PDF. And in a couple of seconds, I'll download this and show you that the PDF is using yet different typefaces or fonts in for the header and the body. So this is a feature that's been added to all of our themes. Um, it, it helps if you like a theme, but don't like a particular font or don't like a particular font in a particular format. It just gives you the, a bit more flexibility and um, power to customize those things in different contexts without having to pick a whole new theme or get rid of the theme because you just didn't like the typeface. So here you'll see, this, if I go into the chapter, this font and this font are different from, from this font and this font. You can see there's subtle but slight differences. And I could change them back or put them to the default if I wanted to. This is a book level setting and it's available now in all of our themes. Um, there's a question I see from Cheryl in the chat. Oh, sorry, I, there's a couple of questions that I missed. Um, Ariana, the question is, would you just need to add the new ID for GA4? Yes, exactly. You would just generate whatever the ID is in Google Analytics for GA4, and you would just enter that in that field, and GA4 would begin working. You could then remove the UA or leave it in place for as long as you want. You can send both types of analytics to Google and sort it out, but um, it's up to you. You can replace it or duplicate it. Cheryl had a question about readability. So the question was, to improve readability with long book titles, is there a way to change the all caps to title case or sentence case? Yes, for sure. So Cheryl, what you're talking about, I guess would be, is this right here what you're asking about? Exactly. Okay, so let me show you that. That would be uh, customizing the CSS. So here I would ins I'd use my browser tool to inspect this and I say, okay, this is the H1 class reading header title. And there's probably a CSS rule right here that says text transform. If I take this rule out uh, and I were to say um, text transform, that's the rule that we want there. So this is custom CSS. You could make a feature request and say, hey, do this everywhere because I think it's better for readability. Or you could do it at the individual book level by coming into your book and saying appearance, custom styles. I'd come in and set this. And I'm going to say text transform none. So I've written new CSS and I'm saying apply this CSS to my book. Hopefully this will do the trick. There we go. So I just changed that for that book. That's how you could do it with custom CSS. Um, if in lesson until we made that a global change everywhere. I hope that helps with that question, Cheryl. Yes, thanks very much. So if we wanted to apply that to all of the books in our catalog, we would just submit that as a feature request? Yeah, I think probably you could send it to premium support and say, hey, uh, I think all caps titles are hard for legibility and readability. This is an accessibility issue. Please make them sentence case or make them right. no, don't text transform. And then what I would do is it would probably be a pull request that one of our developers open. That's kind of a one line fix. And if we agreed that's something we want to implement universally, that would be a very fast and easy thing for us to do. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Any other questions that people have about the font selector or the Google Analytics that I didn't address already? Uh, yeah, I have a question that I think is related to the themes. Um, so I'm wondering, is there a way to easily tell what the differences are across all of the themes especially those that are not related to the font selection. Because right now, you know, I think most of our faculty or Pressbooks users choose their theme based on the appearance, but now that we can also adjust the font, it would be helpful to know if you really want this feature, you should use this theme or one of these themes, you know, like a comparison chart or something would be helpful. I don't know if that exists already. Ariana, it doesn't exist. And that is a great idea. I, the, the honest truth is, I don't even know what all the differences are between our themes. 
So somebody knew at some point, um, it was probably Hugh or our past developers. Um, and I will suggest that to our support team and our documentation team. The themes, there's like hundreds and hundreds of possible variables that could be slightly different from theme to theme. And it's a bit overwhelming if we presented all of them, but we could present probably some high level differences, like what's different from theme to theme. We don't do that yeah. right now. And that, that's a great idea. Thank you, Ariane. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Many of you have wanted to know both the impact of your books and providing analytics or stats about page views and downloads is one way to do that. But another way that you can see that a book has reach in the world is by understanding more about how it's been adopted or used by other people. If you publish an openly licensed book, it means that other people have permission to make a copy and revise that copy and redistribute that copy. We, we support something in Pressbooks called cloning. And it's previously, it was very difficult if you wrote a book to know if your book had been cloned and if your book had been cloned, where it had been cloned and who had cloned it and what they had done with it. And we knew that authors and network managers wanted to know more information about clones that had been made of their book, just to see the life that their book has taken on outside of their network. And so we've added a new couple of a couple of new features that help with this. The first is if you're a network manager, you have a network stats page, and you can see things like users over time, books over time, who's made the most revisions on your network, network storage. And now there's a new thing here that is a little stat feature here that's called most cloned books. So it's a little graph or a little chart, and it's going to reload. And it's going to show you, since we added this feature at the end of last year, which books on your network have been cloned the most often. We're trying to figure out a way that we could add some retroactive information. We know quite a bit about clones that have happened on networks that we host. We haven't yet added the backfill data, and we may never be able to. But for now, since the end of last year, this will keep track of how many times each of your books have been cloned and which have been cloned the most. So you'll see this graph if you're a network manager. And if you were to click on a particular book, like what is Test Shapeshifter? You would see each book now has a new page uh, that's called Book Info that tells you about, here's the book that I have, here's when it was created, here's how many times it has been cloned. So our cloning routine now has a feature where it's like, when you finish, please inform the parent book that you made a clone and where you live. Now, there's a couple things I want to note about this. We only added the ability to reliably track successful clones. It was technically like right before the end of 2023, but we're saying at the beginning of 2023. The list may not include all clones made before that time. And the second piece is this URL here, it was a real URL when the clone was completed but we have no way of knowing whether that book is still live now or whether that book still serves up this, the Pressbooks book. So please exercise some caution or restraint. Like if you choose to visit this book, know that it may not be a book anymore. It may have been deleted. The, the host of this network could have replaced it with some other resource, but at the best of our knowledge, at the time the clone was made, this was where it lived and this was when the clone was made. So every book author right now, it lives in under tools in the book dashboard and a page called cloning stats. We may decide to move that somewhere else or rearrange this when we redo the book dashboard. But for now, that's where it's at. And every book that has been cloned has one of these pages. For network managers, again, you can see this graph in the most clone books thing. And each of these will link to the particular, tell me more about the clones that have been made for a given book. So that's a new feature. Hopefully that will help give you more visibility into the life that your books take on, your open books take on after they leave your network. And I'm open to any questions or uh, comments people have about that feature. Is there a way to automate some kind of notification if a clone happens based on that? Yeah, potentially, yes, Liz. We've thought about this. And um, I would love to hear from you about the kind of notifications that you would like. We don't want to spam people with a bunch of notifications. But it is possible potentially to notify either a network manager or author or authors when their book has been cloned. Is that something you'd be interested in having? And if so, what kind of notifications would you want? I um, do get some notifications and I think that I normally opt into those. Um, so maybe an opt-in type 
option would be nice. Um, like a tell me when my book has been cloned kind of opt-in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or even at the network, you know, for network managers too. Um, but I think it would be interesting for authors to be able to have that option too. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Other thoughts from network managers or people? Do you, would you or your authors be interested in notifications? And if so, does opt-in sound like the right way to go? Yeah, thanks. I see a thumbs up. This is something we may discuss and we might come back to in the future, but appreciate um, the input on that. And thanks for asking, Liz. That's a idea we had talked about and we haven't built that feature yet. We probably need to do a bit more research with authors and network managers to find out what they want so that it's useful and not just noise for them. Um, another change that we made, this is probably of interest mainly for developers or people who are hosting their own Pressbooks networks, but we have now ensured that Pressbooks and all of the plugins and themes that we maintain are fully compatible with PHP 8.1. It's a newer release of PHP. We are now running PHP 8.1 on all of our production servers hosting Pressbooks, and things are working smoothly. So if you are an open source user hosting your own Pressbooks, you can safely upgrade to PHP 8.1. We'll be working on PHP 8.2 compatibility next. Um, so we're keeping up with WordPress on that, and we're keeping up with the latest releases of PHP. Thanks to our developers for lots of hard and visible work, just making sure that we do that. The benefit for you, I guess, is you're running the, a later version of PHP, which will be more secure. It should be faster, and it includes some improved functions and tools that developers like to, to use and benefit from. All right, so the next thing that I want to show is the coming soon piece. This is something that you got an email from me about, probably, and that you've seen a blog post or a community forum post about. But we have really, uh, over the last several months, we've been talking to and doing a lot of research of, into what do network managers need to administer and run their networks better or more easily? And in the course of those conversations, many of you participated. So if you have, thank you very much. We have redesigned a couple of pieces of the network manager experience. And I want to kind of give you a tour of what you'll see and uh, what's going to happen. And we're pretty close to releasing this. So this is much closer to release than the last time when I was just showing you a wireframe. So first, I'm going to just start with the login experience. If I'm a network manager and I come to a network, I'm going to log in as a network manager. So I'll click the sign in button. So a network manager logs in. And the first thing that you will see if you are a network manager is a new dashboard. You've seen that we've already built dashboards for users and for books. This is the last piece of that dashboard redesign. So network managers, this will be your new dashboard. It'll have a little welcome message that will tell you the name of your network. It will tell you very basic information about the number of books, the number of users, and a link where you can go to that stats page that we were just showing you. So if I were to click this link, I would then see the detailed stats about users, books, revisions, storage, and clones. The next thing that you would see would be, here are the three basic tasks that you want to do to update your homepage. And when I say your homepage, what I mean is the page that users see when they first visit your network, this page here. As the network manager, you control what gets displayed on this page and what doesn't. And so the first thing we'll show you is on your dashboard, there'll be a link that says, customize the appearance. If you click this link, it takes you to the page where you can customize the appearance of your network. So you'll see a page that looks like this. You can change things like the title of this, Pressbooks Network, and you'll see it being updated in real time, a test network for publishing books. And you can see, I could add a logo. I could change the colors to the branding colors of my institution. All the things that you do to customize the homepage of your network, that's gonna be available to you directly from your dashboard. We know that's a really common task for new network managers. And so we put it front and center. The second link is gonna allow you to create or edit pages. So if you visit the root network site, you'll notice you could make additional pages like a help page or a contact page and link them in your header and footer. So if you wanted to make a help page or a contact us page, they would look like this. You could go ahead and do so from this menu here. It lets you create or edit pages. So you'll see, the about page, the catalog page, the help, and the home page. The third 
choice is if you are using one of our networks and you have Coco Analytics in, in, installed, you'll see there'll be some analytics for your homepage, which will tell you information about how frequently your homepage and your homepage pages are visited um, by the public. So in this case, this is not a network that we use very often, but you'll see over the last month, there have been eight visits to my homepage and here's when people visited them. So that's that first block here, the update homepage block. Those are the most common actions you'll do for your homepage. And then as a network manager, you'll administer your network. And here's the three most common actions that network managers told us they do. The first thing is that they adjust their network settings. So if you click on this link, this will take you to all the settings that you can control as a network manager. There's the Google Analytics one I was showing you earlier. There's the settings about book and user registration. And there are the settings about your network defaults. It shows you who your network managers are. If you're using the results for LMS plugin, how many people have used it. And then some defaults for uploads and language and page size and book theme. That's all available from the dashboard for network managers. The second and third links here are gonna be your book list and your user list. If you run a network before, you've seen these before, but your book list is the list of all the books on your network with a whole bunch of filters that help you filter what's on your network by type. And the user list is very similar, but for users. So here's all the users on your network. And you could say, I wanna see everybody who has the admin role in at least two books. Okay, just this person. And I could download that list as a CSV if I want. Finally, the bottom section here are, here are the support resources that matter most to you as a network manager. So we're linking to the network manager guide, which is our written guide documentation. We're linking to the community forum, which is where network managers can go to discuss items of interest with each other or with us. There's a link to the webinar series that we offer. We offer free webinars on a monthly basis. They're sometimes useful for network managers and very often useful for end users. And finally, if you're hosting a network with us, there'll be a link that you can just contact premium support directly. This is where you would go if you get stuck or you have questions you can't answer. So what we've tried to do is say, what is everything that you need to do most? Let's put it in one place in an easy to navigate location. I saw a question from Nick, which says, is there any chance of having user specific analytics for those working on books instead of the page by page editing information? Nick, could you say a bit more about what you mean by that? I'm not sure I was, was tracking what you're saying. Sure. Um, the, the reason I ask is because <laughs> I have a lot of books that I have my hands in right now um, and even beyond OpenRN. And the concern is being able to see when user, like a specific user being able to see more of a comprehensive overview of where all they've been in a book instead of having to crawl through the back end of the book page by page down at the bottom to see, yeah. oh, they were in here, say January 22nd. Is there any talk about making that more of like a, oh, I can just, click on this user and see all the different places they've been? Great, I'll show you what we have now, which you may not know about, and then you can tell me what we could do to make this better. So okay. if, if you look at your user list right here, mm -hmm. each user has this little piece underneath them called info. So okay. this is user info. So for example, um, let's. this is not the greatest network because there's not a lot of people on it, but I'll look at Thomas PP. When I click the info page, every one of your users will have this block. This tells you who they are, their name, when their account was created, when they logged in last, how many books they belong to, and how many edits they've made. And then this is the only drill down information we have about a book, but it will tell you this user has made this many revisions on this book, and here's the last time they made a revision. Is that close to what you want, or and what's missing from this for you? What's missing is being able to see all the individual edits over a period of time. Like which chapters they've edited and when in a given book? When they've been in their EOP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That Which I mean, be... we can we can see page by page. It's just a little time consuming. Um, and the reason that comes up is because yeah. <laughs> when there's a team of four or five of us in there, a lot of times we forget where we've been. If you're working as a team, you want to be able to see who's done what when in a given book. Correct. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting problem. I we don't have we haven't we don't have anything good for that right now. But I okay. can see why that would be useful. And what I can do is I can work with you and other people who want this to put this as a feature to our backlog and figure out what might, what we could build to give you that kind of information. But right now there's, you're right, there's not much for that. 
Okay. Yeah. It would just be more for like auditing and reporting, honestly. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah for I, people I, who need to know that information. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk you and I, and then uh, I'll open this up to other network managers over time and we'll make sure we do some good requirements needs gathering before we start designing a solution for that. But that makes sense to okay. me. I could see why you want that. Okay. Awesome. Thank I, you. Think it, I think it'd be real uh, useful just to pull the last edit date and time to the top of the page, the top of the edit page. Cause some of, mm -hmm. some, some of our oh, interesting. chapters are like, you know, you have to scroll, 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 scroll oh, just yeah. to get down. <laughs> that, that would probably be kind of nice. So let me, let me share my screen and make sure I understand what you're saying and that everybody's on the same page with this. So let's say I go to this book. So I'm going to edit a chapter, for example. I can't tell when this book chapter was last revised unless, I mean, I can look down here for created, but I have to scroll all the way down here before I see the revision block. Yeah. And if it's a really fat, in fact, if you just, yeah, if you just added it like right above or right below the created date, that yeah. would probably solve I wonder it. whether like, for example, as an individual user, I bet you I can drag this. Um, where can I put it? Uh, I'm probably going to break something here because I just moved it. So, okay. I can move it just below the text block, but yeah. So you're saying displaying it somewhere up here, like last revised, last revised would be at a glance, very helpful for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause scrolling all the way down to see that is not a great user experience. I, I have just felt your pain by trying to do it myself. <laughs> or and maybe even over in the sidebar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thank great suggestion. Thank you. Um, you, you can't you can't jump right to the bottom of the page but if you have a really long page you probably have a lot of edits and so that list of edits you have to go up you know you have to jump up two or three four times to to get yeah. to the sweet spot there perfect thank you very helpful uh, i'm going to go back to the screen recording part and the screen share and show you a couple of other things that we've worked on besides this dashboard that are coming soon to network managers. So currently, if you're a network manager and you log into the admin dashboard, there's a problem for you in that when you first log in, you're taken to your root site or your homepage dashboard, and you have this big old dashboard of which you only ever use appearance and sometimes pages. And it looks really similar to a book dashboard. And so we've heard from dozens of you, this is really confusing. What dashboard am I actually on? And you then have a network admin dashboard where you do most of the other things. It also looks really similar. And so knowing which dashboard you're on, add to the mix a, a book dashboard here. You've got one dashboard, two dashboards, three dashboards, and they look similar and you're not always sure which one to go to. So here are the changes that we've made. As a network manager, you will now have one single menu up here that says administer network and everything you need to do is going to be consolidated into one side nav instead of let's count them one two three four five six seven eight nine plus however many child items and one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and however many child items your new dashboard looks like this one item here one item here one item here, one item here, one item here, one, two, because there's two different stats pages you could view. And then as many integrations as you have, those are the children menu. So we've radically consolidated this. You can still do everything you need to do to administer your network, but it's in one place and presented, we hope, much more clearly. So this is coming soon. That's going to be the side dashboard menu as well as your top dashboard menu. The other changes we're making are gonna be for everyone who uses the top nav. So here's your current top nav, it's real small. And your My Books can be a little bit confusing because if you wanna create and clone a book, you have to go under My Books to do it. And then you see a list of books. Here's what we're doing. My Books is just gonna have a list of books that you have. Create a book is permanently a button at the top dash. And so is clone a book. Anywhere I go in the admin interface, whether I go to a book dashboard, or anywhere else, I will always have the ability to create a book or clone a book if my network gives me the permission to do that. That will be true for you as network managers. 
that will be true for your end users. If they want to create and clone a book, they should always be able to do it from the top dash. And the other thing that we've done is for you as a network manager, you might want to add multiple users. Adding users shouldn't be a six click process. It's now a click this button to add users. We built a new page that lets you bulk add users to your network. I can add as many emails as I want on one and multiple lines. And here's what will happen. Here's three people I want to add to my network. And I'll get a little message that tells me what happened when I tried to do this. Okay. These two people weren't on my network, so I invited them. This person already existed. They've been added. So now I just bulk added users. Network managers will be able to do that anywhere they go on the page by using this add users button. You can ignore it. There's these little warning messages. This is a test network. Um, you can ignore those. Those will not appear on your Brentsbrook network just to correct your confidence. Any questions for us about changes that are coming to the side nav for network managers or the top dashboard for all users? Is there a, an approximate time frame on when um, particularly the clone a book, create a new book will show up for end users? We're putting together some workshops right now for our faculty and I, I'd like to know kind of when that switch will happen. Yeah, great. So right now it's still available. The options are available, but they're hidden under that My Books menu. Right. It'll be part of our next release. And my expectation is that we will probably release this to production uh, either the last week of February, so next week, or early March. Oh, okay. Not, we don't have a fixed date yet, but it's coming very soon. Within okay, probably that, works. that works as far as our timeline. So the okay. change will be implemented before we start. So it's good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for checking, Jamie. And that's kind of why we wanted to preview it, because I know this, if you were to do a training and suddenly your interface was different, that can be disruptive. The last thing that I want to um, share and then talk about with you as a roundtable topic is the question of discoverability. So framing this, what we want to do is we want to help authors and network managers make sure that the books that they've published can be found by people who want to read them, <laughs> uh, download them, buy them, clone them, however they want to be found. And so historically, what we focused on is making sure that the metadata in the books is good and shared with things like search engines. We've also built tools like the Pressbooks directory or the Better Network catalog so that you have a place that you can showcase and find your books. But we realize that people look for books lots of other places besides the Pressbooks directory and besides Google and Bing and other search engines. And so we want to work on the problem of discoverability. And one of the first things that we decided to do is um, EBSCO has a product called Faculty Select. The product manager there is a former network manager at Pressbooks and said, hey, I know about the Pressbooks directory. You have thousands of books that people publish. They're great. We would like to get them into our free Faculty Select product. And so we uh, have, have um, an agreement with EBSCOhost that we are providing them with the open metadata from all of the openly licensed books in Pressbooks directory. They are going to be ingesting those into their faculty select product. It's a discovery tool to help people that are thinking about adopting open textbooks. This is going to be announced, I think, later this month uh, or early in March. I think we're pretty excited about trying this out and piloting this with, with faculty select. And we're also trying to figure out other places and other ways that you would like us to focus on in helping to solve this problem of discoverability. Uh, and so some possibilities that we've thought about, I guess, are um, better mark records for library catalogs, uh, things like OAI PMH, which is an interoperable metadata standard that a lot of catalogs use, or a feed that includes information about EPUB downloads that could be consumed by uh, free lending libraries and other kinds of things. My question for those of you who are network managers are, what are your discoverability goals? What are the things that you think we ought to prioritize on and what matters to you? And I can pause the recording so that you can speak freely if you want. Thanks again, everybody, for coming and for catching up with Pressbooks Updates. Thanks for attending this month, and we'll see you next month.